Okay, the broadcast is now starting. Um, uh, hello, everybody. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to what I hope will be a timely and valuable webinar providing an introduction to Prindex and perceptions of tenure security co-organized by Prindex and the Land Portal Foundation. Thanks very much to everybody for joining. My name is Malcolm Childress. I'm the co-director of Prindex and co-executive director of Global Land Alliance. And it's my honor and uh, privilege to moderate this forum. And it's my first time ever moderating a webinar. So i um, very interested to see how it goes. Around the world, um, our topic today, insecure property rights are a huge issue that's hiding in plain sight. Um, insecurity of property rights prevents families from feeling confident about the future. It keeps businesses from investing. It limits the ability of communities to be more productive, to manage uh, natural resources. Hundreds of millions of people around the world lack uh, secure land and property rights. Um, and this, um, this problem hiding in plain sight keeps poor people impoverished. It perpetuates injustice and inefficiency and misuse of natural resources. Luckily, there is a growing recognition of the need to change the situation. And crucial to this effort um, is the push to get better metrics um, on the real situation of tenure security uh, security of property rights um, so that citizens, governments, business, um, and civil society are better able to understand the nature, the magnitude of this challenge and how to, how to overcome it. And, you know, I've always noted that the land sector has been at a disadvantage compared to other sectors such as health and education by not having basic uh, indicators and basic numbers about the magnitude and nature of, of the challenge. And this is precisely why we're, we're here today. The Prindex initiative is an effort to measure the citizens' perceptions of land rights and security around the world. Working with Gallup, one of the world's leading survey organizations, and in collaboration with national land agencies, statistical offices, uh, we're carrying out surveys of citizens' perceptions of the, their tenure security. And our objective for this webinar is to make stakeholders around the world um, aware of the Prindex initiative and some of the results and findings and issues in the 15 countries in which we've collected data so far. We see this webinar as a first step in a broader collaboration in which we seek to work together uh, with all of you working directly in countries um, in which we are collecting data. And we would hope that this will be a long-term effort to monitor and see and support change to create greater security. And we hope to be in touch with many of you um, after this webinar. How we're gonna work, um, I'll provide a overview presentation of Prindex and these results uh, from 15 countries, and then we'll go into a panel discussion. So let me, um, just introduce the panelists who are on the webinar. We have um, Alfred Brownell from Green Advocates Liberia and distinguished scholar at the Northeastern University uh, Law School in Boston, United States. And he's also the uh, Scholar Rescue Fund Chair for the Bo Biden Foundation. We also have Ibrahim Aka, Doctor of Public Law and Land Specialist uh, for IPAR, the uh, Initiative Prospective Agricole et Rural of Senegal. We have also Claudia Mondragon, Director of the uh, Territorial Management Observatory at the National University of Honduras. And unfortunately, our final panelist, uh, Joanne Kagwanja, uh, Coordinator of the Africa Land Policy Center, has been uh, called to Khartoum on urgent travel and is not able to participate. Um, so uh, we have uh, filling in David Amia, Prindex colleague, colleague and director of the International Center for Evaluation of Development to explain our collaboration 
with African Land Policy Center. We um, have asked the panelists to address um, a, sort of three areas, the importance of uh, citizen perceptions of their property rights on land governance and its consequences, um, to reflect on some of the results from the uh, Prindex surveys and for their countries and some of the issues um, in which they are uh, working and in which these uh, new data may be uh, useful. The panelists are experts in the field and in our countries, and we look forward to a dynamic discussion that will help us uh, to find pathways for using Prindex and to propel um, conversations about policy and about movement building uh, for policy reform and implementation uh, in countries all over the world. So let me begin uh, with this overview presentation for a few minutes, and then we will uh, go to the panelists. Um, we'd like everybody uh, online to encourage you to ask questions, which I think you can uh, type in in the, in the interface. And then we will uh, try to address as many questions as possible during the uh, open discussion that follows. Um, I'd like to say we really want to, to stay in touch beyond the webinar um, to get updates from Prindex on a regular basis. Please visit Prindex.net, our website, where you can sign up for our newsletter. And I think um, well, we'll be posting a link to that in the chat. Um, and also, if you use like to share your thoughts, um, please use the ha hashtag uh, Prindex webinar and tag uh, Prindex. Okay, so let me just go into um, a presentation of some of the results um, of the uh, initial 15 countries um, that we surveyed. Um, Prindex is the um, short name for the um, Global Property Rights Index. It's a joint initiative of ODI, a uh, think tank based in the UK, the Global Land Alliance, a uh, nonprofit based in the United States and supported by UK Aid and the Omidyar Network. And I just want to, uh, these first 15 countries, and if um, the organizers can run the um, presentation on the screen for me, um, we'll share that. Uh, we collected during uh, July to October of this year data in 15 countries. There were 10 of this group in Africa, four in Latin America, and one in Southeast Asia. Um, and data were collected by uh, survey organizations, Gallup and Crosstab. Um, I just want to uh, share what I think are some of the, the key messages in, the, in this main area of expression of, uh, of insecurity, the average across all these countries came out to about one in four people, 25%, which represents uh, just in these 15 countries, something around 41 million adults um, expressing risk of losing their property. Um, on the converse, tenure security um, is 60% um, on average. The rates varied uh, fairly widely from a high of 44% of um, adult respondents expressing insecurity to a low of 8%. We ask about uh, formal documentation and um, the finding is that slightly more than half adults, half of adults say that they do have uh, some formal documentation by which we mean type of document issued by a government uh, land agency. Well, more than a third indicate they have no documentation. Um, and um, as I think probably expected, the owners and renters with formal documentation are expressing significantly more tenure security than those without. Um, in terms of the differences between men and women, the average differences um, when asked just simply about um, about insecurity are similar, but when we drill down into certain scenarios, particularly about um, the 
potential of a uh, divorce or the death of a spouse, then women express a much greater worry about forced, being forced out of their homes. And these, I think, are some of the key finds. I'll go through some of these now. Um, I don't want to dwell on the methodology, but these were uh, nationally representative samples um, done face to face with a three stage clustering. And then we weighted um, these by age, gender, and urban rural uh, based on census data. The samples were approximately um, 1,000 to 2,000 uh, in each country. And the core question we we're asking people about this perception is really in the next five years, how likely or unlikely is it that you could lose the right to use this property or part of your property against your will? And so as I noted, um, we're now gonna just look at some of the main findings. Um, this main, uh, this, um, if here we have the, um, the uh, 15 countries grouped um, in geographic um, sub cohorts, um, you can see in the light orange is the levels of insecurity um, and in the darker, um, the darker reddish brown are the levels of security. And if you look at the very, we see this uh, Burkina Faso and Liberia on the far left with the uh, highest uh, expressed uh, rates of tenure insecurity. And then we see this uh, variety. We actually had the lowest um, rate of insecurity in Rwanda. Um, and then you can see some, uh, the, the total sample average um, on the far right of 25%. Let's, um, we ask about reasons um, and really the top two reasons given were that the owner or the renter um, may ask the respondent to leave. And we also saw family disagreements um, as uh, the second most frequent, uh, but we had quite a wide variety of, of reasons given. Let's take the next slide. Um, certainly we um, see that there is a difference between owners and renters. Uh, I think that the nature of rental contracts uh, themselves being somewhat less um, secure in many cases than, than owning. And we see in the orange here, uh, the higher rates of insecurity of, of, uh, of, of renters. And I, I should mention that, you know, we essentially classify people of different types of tenure, owning, renting, uh, permission uh, to stay and within ownership, we, we also ask about several different types. Let's take the next slide. Um, I don't wanna to dwell too much here, but um, in some countries, the, uh, we see higher rates of insecurity among the rural population. And in other countries, we see a higher rates uh, on the urban population. And in the urban, we see that fairly highly correlated with what we saw in the previous slide about um, rental. Um, but I think there's a lot to, to probe into here in terms of uh, differences among countries. And of course, as we gather more countries in the future, we're looking to uh, deepen this uh, cross-country analysis. Uh, next slide. And everybody, the, uh, this PowerPoint is available on the uh, chat interface as a PDF um, for, for download. Um, here's the result that I mentioned in terms of average um, perception of insecurity uh, between men and women. There are only two of the 15 countries in which women's uh, expressed um, more insecurity on average um, in a statistically significant uh, difference. But if we go to the next slide, um, we see that women are more worried about losing um, 
their property rights in the event of a spousal death and divorce um, in almost in almost every country and in some places with quite a significant difference. So I think that's a, um, a really important um, area to, to be concerned about. Let's go on. In terms of documentation across the um, sample of approximately 18,000 respondents in these 15 countries, 54% uh, um, responded that they do have some formal documentation. 37% uh, said they had uh, no documentation and 8% said they had informal documentation only, things like a utility bill or a, a tax receipt. Um, so really more than a third of respondents have none at all. And this is um, correlated with their perception of insecurity. Next slide. Um, and now um, if we just uh, zoom in on the, the subset of respondents who actually are owners and renters themselves, um, then we see that actually possession of formal documentation is even uh, somewhat higher than the, than the average. Next one. Um, and here is that uh, result then that those, uh, if we're looking at this um, group, we see quite a bit more um, security uh, expressed by those respondents who do have uh, formal documentation. And this, these um, step uh, graphs represent the um, percentage of greater security um, represented by those with formal documentation. Although we see in a few countries at the far right that, um, that people with formal documentation are actually expressing greater insecurity. Next slide. And we also ask um, a few questions about other um, dimensions or other ways of thinking about um, security. Um, and these, um, we see also that about 25% uh, of respondents are not confident that authorities would protect them if their property rights were threatened. A similar percentage uh, overall in the sample so they would not know how to defend their rights um, if they were challenged. And, um, and about 36% do not believe that property rights are well uh, protected in their country. Next one. Please. Um, so moving on, um, these um, results are um, really a new, uh, creating a new baseline for policy discussion, for action and research. Um, they're not by any stretch of the means a full story. They're more of an entry point into, I think, what's happening at country level. As we take, uh, we need uh, to, to be complemented by more detailed data um, at country level uh, to really focus in on, on policies. Um, going forward, we're planning to, um, to do the similar data collection in over 100 countries in 2019, uh, putting these questions onto the uh, Gallup World Poll and trying to engage uh, with you in uh, our um, stakeholders in these areas um, in regions and countries across the world. Okay, so that's it for um, this um, presentation. And please um, download it. Please go to the website where there's a, um, a report on this. Um, I'd like to now, um, you know, turn to uh, the panelists. And let me first go to Ibrahim Akka from Ipar in Senegal. Ibrahim, welcome to the webinar. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, can you please uh, talk a little bit about um, perceptions of land governance and its consequences and what is happening in this area in Senegal? Ibrahim, the microphone is yours. Yeah, uh, thank you, Malcolm. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in this uh, webinar today. 
um, Dr. Ibrahim Maka, researcher on land tenure security at IPA, uh, Initiative Prospective Agricole Rural, a think tank based in Dhaka and working on rural development issues in Senegal and the sub region. In our experiences, a lot of decision can be taken by communities based on the perception. Some communities sell their lands based on the perception they have that they, their land may no longer be secured. In the peri-urban land, that is the land that surround our cities, land owners prefer to sell their land before it is taken away from the government. This is often happening as land pressure grow and uh, there is no interest in uh, investing in this land. In Senegal, uh, the land market is forbidden in the legal framework, but uh, the actors produce their own rules in the shadow of the official legal system with the participation of the administration, the local district, the businessmen and, in bro and brokers. Uh, in Sukhoi, perception of tenure security also limits access to land rights by women, as they assume that their land's demand will not be genuinely uh, considered according to the rule of the society. Uh, in Senegal, most of the part, uh, most most of the part of the country, uh, the patriarchal system uh, is uh, is there. So uh, perception can also lead to injustice because when people perceive the jurisdictional system as weak, people they don't trust it and they will not claim their uh, rights there. They will then rely on alternative justice most of the time, but this system can produce unexpected and negative results. That's kind of some ideas that I can give about the perception and its importance. Oh, thank you very much, Ibrahima. And I think um, obviously a lot of issues to, to consider in Senegal in terms of um, the land market itself, um, this patriarchal system and, and questions about access to, uh, to justice uh, within the formal system. Um, let me now uh, turn to Claudia Mondragon from the National University of Honduras. Claudia, can you um, also speak to this question about the importance of uh, citizens' perceptions and land governance and the situation in Honduras? And um, Claudia will be speaking in Spanish, and um, I'll translate uh, for Claudia after uh, each of her. Um, is it Claudia, uh, por favor? Buen día a todos, muchas gracias por la invitación. Como universidad y como observatorio, realmente es un placer para nosotros participar en, en este webinar. Y te digo, de forma general, en lo que respecta a los derechos de tenencia, Honduras ha tenido avances, pero no lo suficientes para asegurar que el derecho al acceso de tierra se cumpla en todos los casos o que los pueblos indígenas y afrodescendientes, además de las mujeres en general, pues no ven mermado el ejercicio de sus derechos de la tierra. Mm, um... Claudia is saying, um, it, glad to be here, but really in general terms, uh, Honduras has made uh, significant progress, but not enough to ensure that the right of access to land is fulfilled in, in, in all cases, particularly with indigenous and Afro-descendant people and women in general. Um, and in, in general, um, these uh, groups are not seeing the uh, ability to exercise, they're seeing the, their rights to land uh, actually diminished. Los avances desde la reforma del sistema agrario, sobre todo en el año de 1975, se reflejan en los datos de titulación del sector reformado, sobre todo empresas asociativas campesinas, con un 14% de los títulos. El sector étnico, sobre todo pueblos indígenas y afrodescendientes, con 39% de los títulos y el sector independiente pues con un 46.8% de los títulos, pero el total de la tierra titulada al 2018 representaba apenas un 31.37% del total nacional. Imagínate, y ahora vemos que las mujeres jefas de familia en el periodo estudiado solo fueron favorecidas con el 37.01% de los títulos emitidos. 
Okay, so Claudia is speaking then about the um, the titling in Honduras that there have been um, advances since the agrarian reform of 1975, um, in which the uh, campesino enterprises have 14% of titles, the ethnic sector, which are the indigenous and Afro-descendant people, 39.8%, um, and the uh, independent uh, sector, uh, independent landholders with 46%. But um, out of this, the, the overall uh, land that's been titled, it's under title in 2018, only represents 31.3%. 37% of the total national uh, properties. And that female heads of household um, actually only have 37% uh, uh, of titles. Claudia, please continue. Todavía, pues, existen importantes retos y no pueden considerarse totalmente seguros esos derechos, tomando en cuenta las amenazas que traen cultivos comerciales, sobre todo como la palma africana o, o el extractivismo, refiriéndonos a minas hidrocarburos, generación de, de energía, entre otros. Estas amenazas al territorio condicionan la adecuada distribución de la tierra, el cumplimiento de los derechos de la mujer a la misma y la gobernanza centrada en las personas. Pues ya que la percepción de actores clave es que la tenencia está centrada en intereses privados en busca de la continua acumulación de riqueza en algunos pocos. So, um, she's saying that um, there are still a lot of challenges uh, and that these uh, rights and particularly talking about the rural areas cannot be considered uh, totally secure, um, particularly uh, taking into account uh, threats uh, represented by uh, the uh, expansion of commercial crops uh, such as African palm and the um, um, extractive industries like mining, hydrocarbon, power, and that these are uh, threats to, um, to uh, territorial um, integrity and to the um, adequate distribution of land, the fulfillment of women's rights. Um, and the uh, perception of many key actors is that tenure is centered on, um, on um, private interests who are, um, searching um, for accumulation for the wealth of a, of a limited minority. In Honduras, además, la amenaza más grande para el ejercicio de los derechos de la tenencia de seguros es la concentración de tierras. Por ejemplo, Vía Campesina en 2013 establecía que en Honduras la concentración de la tierra en pocas manos es una de las mayores expresiones de, de exclusión e injusticia social y esta situación afecta tanto a hombres como a mujeres. Pues en 50 años la concentración de la tierra se ha profundizado enormemente. So, uh, in Honduras, the uh, greatest threat uh, for the exercise of secure tenure rights is the concentration of land. Um, Via Campesina uh, says that in Honduras, the concentration of land in few hands is one of the greatest expressions of exclusion and injustice, and that this situation affects both men and women, um, at, that in 50 years, the last 50 years, this concentration of uh, ownership um, has um, deepened. En otras palabras, la economía campesina de pequeña escala se ha precarizado, al grado que el tamaño de una pequeña unidad agrícola ha, ha reducido enormemente su tamaño de 2.3 a 1.5 hectáreas. Insuficiente esto para asegurar la vida digna de una familia campesina. En sentido contrario, las propiedades de más de 50 hectáreas han mantenido similar número de tamaño, pero han aumentado su acaparamiento en la tierra agrícola. Uh -huh. So, um, basically, the small-scale peasant economy has become uh, more precarious, um, and the size of uh, um, the small agricultural units um, has gone down from 2.3 to 1.5 hectares, uh, which is not sufficient for a dignified life for a campesino family. Um, and uh, in the other direction, properties greater than 50 hectares uh, in Honduras have um, 
maintained a bit at the same size uh, or actually increased. Um, thank you, Claudia, for those um, uh, comments about the uh, land and property rights security in Honduras. I'd like to switch now to Alfred Brownell. And Alfred, um, can you also speak to this uh, same topic of the importance of uh, perceptions on land go governance and its consequences uh, in Liberia? And I think um, also a little bit of what is this current status with the, um, the land rights law that uh, people are, I think the international community is very interested in hearing about. Please, Alfred, the microphone is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Malcolm, and uh, thank you so much for also um, sending an invitation to participate in this webinar. I'm really excited and feel pleased to join this conversation. Um, I am uh, currently uh, in the U.S., but I previously uh, you know, from Liberia, and where I uh, work with Green Advocates, one of the leading uh, civil society organizations that have been on the forefront of trying to address the issue of land and tenure security of local communities. And uh, currently in the U.S., I'm, I'm the Northeast University School of Law, where in addition to teaching, I'm also looking at research. Uh, land rights and I've been involved in an initiative uh, trying to um, uh, design, co-design along with uh, activists from local stakeholders, the Global Land Tenure Security Index, but also trying to make sure that um, we can put land tenure data and tools um, through a process of co-design and co-creation in the hands of local stakeholders who will be able to drive or the real reform on the ground because believing that when these stakeholders have uh, the tools and the data, they are better much empowered to pursue this process. With respect to the importance um, of uh, the perception on governance and its consequences, uh, back to Liberia, you know, when the descendants of ex slaves declare Liberia as a sovereign in their declaration of independence, they were clear who the true owners of the land were. They wrote in that secret document, and I quote, under the auspices of the American Colonization Society, we established ourselves here on land acquired by purchase from the laws of the soil. And I repeat that, from the laws of the soil. And they were very clear who the laws of the soil were. But despite the historical account that the purchase was carried out on the barrel of the gun, the question of who legally owns land still remain vague, ambiguous, and complex, rooted in the history and foundation of Liberia. In the history and foundation of Liberia. The importance of perception on land governance and its consequences in Liberia can be seen through the early interaction between the ex-slaves and the aborigines. Why the ex-slaves impose a system of land and property right ownership Based on Eurocentric statutory practices, the Aborigines continue to rely on a system of customary practices. As a result, the country went a series of historical conflict over land and natural resources that define the struggles around citizenship, public participation, and inclusion. Besides the historical land and resource rights conflict characterizing the formation and evolution of Liberia, another importance of perception of land governance and its consequences in Liberia is the fact that the country itself evolved into the two parallel legal processes a formal statutory and an informal customary. Most Liberians, especially those who live in rural areas, as well as slum and squatter communities, do not hold a formal Eurocentric or written title. Instead, they hold informal, unwritten, or oral traditional title, mainly in rural and urban slum communities, based on a system of customary practices and traditions. This perhaps may have influenced Liberian constitution requiring under Article 65 that the Supreme Court should apply both statutory and customary laws, mandating equal treatment of both systems on equal footing. In addition to the constitution, a number of legislative and Supreme Court cases have also addressed the question of perceptions, ownership, and custodial right. This historical trend recognizing informal customary land and property rights, including the perception of rights, have informed several contemporary legislation. In the last four months, for example, and this is the case that uh, Margon have made reference to, Liberia made history when they passed one of the most progressive land right legislation, um, the Land Right Act. 
And despite this historical trend and the judicial attribution relating to perception, ownership and custodial rights and governance in Liberia has remained in an environment of ambiguity, fraud, and false assumptions characterizing the interpretation and the protection of land and property rights, especially the customary land and property rights of the units in Liberia. As a result, successive Liberian governments over time have treated all lands and now privately held under the deed as public while ignoring those legal requirements in the award and granting of land concessions or private property rights on community held land. This flagrantly and unequally treat the fundamental property rights of communities as inferior to statutory property rights. Given the historical conflict associated with land rights, the role that land and natural resources play in fueling Liberia past conflicts, the recent and contemporary massive grabbing of fundamental land and property rights have the potential for creating a perception disruptive on land governance and implication for creating instability and undermining the peace and security of Liberia. Given what I know in my last 20 years of experience working in this field, if Liberia ever degenerate into an analysis of a crisis, unsecure land rights will be the precursor or catalyst driving and feeding that crisis. The recent PINREST report, which is actually the tip of the iceberg, that a million Liberians feel insecure is troubling and a warning signal. It will be easy, for example, for all of us to draw credence that, well, Liberia has actually passed a progressive land right legislation. But as all of us know, a government can ignore even their own laws and create a perception of insecurity with disastrous consequences. Thank you very much, Malcolm. Oh, thank you, Alfred. I think it's very um, important uh, bringing out the, the, the long historical roots, um, the connection between uh, insecurity of, of rights and uh, conflict. And I think you're um, really giving a warning that that um, even progressive legislation is only as good as its implementation. And I really do want to accept your invitation to co-create um, a fuller and better picture of the, of the real land tenure situation with um, uh, uh, colleagues and in, in Liberia that can go beyond this, uh, just this snapshot, which is quite a, a troubling uh, portrait. Uh, thank you. Let's come back to you with this in uh, on the next round, and to to hear more about this. I want to go back to um, Ibrahim Aka now, um, and Ibrahim, looking at um, the results of the um, Prindex survey in Senegal. What are some of the um, the results that you see that are notable? Could you comment on those, please, Ibrahim? Uh, thank you, Malcolm. The data collection was made among 1,012 people across the country. The results show that 77% uh, feel their tenure is secret, which is 21% of people do not feel secret, which in the sub-region average, 33%, compared to Burkina Faso, Senegal is doing better because in this country 44 percent of the people feel insecure this is understandable as the new law passed uh, 2009 is yet now generalized through the national territory of the 351 municipalities the law is only applied in 61 uh, communities or municipalities and uh, this is this with the help of the donor, the, the, the project fi uh, financed by donors. We hope that the government will generalize the application of the law soon. For, so for Senegal, uh, we have some interesting results, uh, others interesting results. 64% uh, believe that property rights in the country are protected. 83% uh, knows how to defend their rights if there is challenge. 
and 82% uh, remain convinced, convinced that the authorities would protect them in the events of disturbance of their rights. In terms of worry about tenure security by gender, in the case of divorce or def death of spouse, 10% of the men and 30% uh, of women are concerned about the laws of their property rights. If a spouse were to die, 50% of the men and 33% of the women are concerned about laws of their rights. In, in the part of the country, the women do not inherit land at all or if they do inherit the land, they only get one part and the man gets two according to the Muslim, uh, to the Muslim religion and uh, the side of the country also. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Ibrahima. Um, yeah, very interesting. Um, I think to s that, uh, you know, this is a relatively uh, high degree of people feeling insecure and perhaps um, further implementation of um, of the of legal reform, uh, maybe a change change that. I think it's also quite notable um, at the same time that a large percentage of people do feel that authorities uh, can protect them, uh, but also a concern, as you note, the, uh, the the much higher percentage of women uh, concerned about losing their rights in a family event. Uh, let me go back to uh, Claudia. Um, what would be some of the results that are uh, jumping out to you uh, and of interest to your work in Honduras? Claudia. Gracias, Malcolm. Te comento, en Honduras se levantó una muestra representativa a nivel nacional de 980 adultos de 18 años o más y se les preguntó sobre sus percepciones y experiencias con los derechos de propiedad y la seguridad de la tenencia en Honduras. Okay, so it's a nationally representative sample of 980 adults, 18 and over, that were surveyed in Honduras, um, asking about their perceptions and experience with property rights and security of tenure. Mm -hmm. El 19% de los encuestados en Honduras, pues se siente inseguro de la tenencia de su tierra y sobre todo los departamentos del Paraíso y La Paz son los que tienen los niveles más altos de inseguridad. Y esto también se ve reflejado pues en temas vinculados como la migración. Los encuestados en las áreas urbanas se sienten más inseguros en la tenencia que los encuestados en las áreas rurales. Y bueno, los hombres se sienten más inseguros en comparación con las mujeres. Um, so, 19% of respondents in Honduras uh, feel insecure about their uh, land tenure uh, with the departments of El Paraíso and La Paz with the highest levels of insecurity. Uh, respondents in urban areas feel more insecure in tenure than respondents in rural areas, and men feel more insecure compared to women. El 53% de los encuestados en Honduras dice que posee documentos formales para demostrar la propiedad o el uso de los derechos de al menos de una de sus propiedades. Mm -hmm. And 53% of respondents in Honduras um, say that they have formal documents to prove ownership or used to the rights of at least one of their properties. Por otro lado, el 46% de los encuestados en Honduras piensa que los derechos de la propiedad están bien protegidos en el país y el 79% dice que sabe cómo defender sus derechos de propiedad y el 62% confían en el apoyo de las autoridades en caso de que se desafíen sus derechos. So, on the other hand, 46% of those interviewed in Honduras um, think, th uh, think that property rights are well protected in the country, although 79% say they know how to defend their property rights, and 62% say that they uh, can rely on the support of authorities in the case of um, uh, their challenge. 33% um, of the sample own their land, 33% um, rent, and 51% are on lands they occupy with permission of the owner. Mm -hmm. Las razones de la inseguridad pues varían entre los propietarios y los inquilinos. La falta de recursos financieros y los desacuerdos con los miembros de la familia fueron las razones más comúnmente establecidas para el tema de inseguridad por parte de los propietarios, 
mientras que el propietario le pide que se vaya o la falta de recursos fueron los motivos más comunes de inseguridad entre los inquilinos. So the reasons for insecurity uh, vary between landlords and tenants. The lack of financial resources and disagreements with family members were the reasons most commonly uh, given um, regarding insecurity on the part of owners, uh, while the owner asking him to leave and the lack of resources are the most common reasons for insecurity among tenants. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me thank you, Claudia, and let's come back to you um, shortly. Alfred, can we come back to you about uh, some of the results and implications um, and perhaps limitations of Prindex data uh, for Liberia. Uh, thank you very much, Malcolm. Um, as I indicated earlier on um, in my intro uh, on this issue uh, concerning the importance of perception and its consequences, um, the, uh, the report from Liberia um, certainly showed that about 43% of the respondents actually felt very insecure um, in 2018. And Liberia actually is placed um, the second highest out of, of 15 countries um, in the region. Um, but uh, meanwhile, um, there's a 50 percent um, of those also interviewed um, felt secure about their property rights, while 64 percent said that they possess some kind of formal documents. Three percent in the white three percent indicating possessing informal documents, and 30 percent said that they had no document at all. The report showed that 23% experienced a loss, while 70% believe that they are well protected. Um, another important highlight is that 90% of those interviewed said they know how to defend their land rights. Now, um, given some of the concerns, uh, I mean, based on this data and based on the earlier intro in terms of the, uh, the, the land tenure landscape in Liberia. I mean, a historical process, you know, were characterized by a series of conflicts around land. I think, you know, for me, it was the first historical land grab. And then um, the civil conflict, which was actually fueled by land and natural resources. And then during the peace process in the last uh, 10, 12 years, a massive grabbing of land in the Liberia. So given my understanding and experience of this land ready landscape in Liberia, it is important to view and analyze these data with current realities. In Liberia, unsecured land rights are one of, the, one of several drivers enabling rural to urban migration, which are facilitated by large skills land acquisition for logging, agriculture, and mining operations associated with transnational cooperation. Most migrants who come from rural communities and poor urban slope, end up in poor urban slope and squatter communities in urban areas that are also characterized by insecure land rights facing constructive potential dispossession and displacement for the second time. In addition to that, just in the last six years alone, from Nima to Grand Bassa, Sino and Maryland County, we've witnessed and observed protests, contests, and complaints, sometimes violent conflict characterizing the investment operations of transnational cooperation in Titan of Liberia 15 counties. The government of Liberia respond to this protest have been in the form of criminalization and 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 and, and, and attack on general community grievances. We've also seen that Liberia has awarded rights to land on a third of its total land mass. Women, which uh, in series of the report don't form more than 50% of Liberian population, are the least and insecure. In a report that we did um, two years ago in Liberia called Women the Least Secure Tenure. It was documented how women had lost access to forests, land, and rivers that formed the basis of their livelihood and secret sites, but did not receive sufficient job or competition to make up for their loss. The report showed that while men faced similar problems, these were exacerbated for women who are primarily responsible for feeding their families, but have fewer tenure rights than men on a customary tenure. They were the least secure. The grabbing link to dispossession, displacement, and migration, which also factor into the least tenure security of women. And when you add on the protest and violence exacerbated by criminalization of legitimate grievances, there is a need for caution, ground truthing, peer review, and further conversation and dialogue around this data. 
I think this webinar presents an opportunity to begin such a dialogue. Mm. Thank you, Alfred. Um, I really hope we that this is an opportunity for that, and I really appreciate the the deeper context that you're giving on the these um, these national print X results and. I think a uh, suggestion that things may even in some cases be worse than what this uh, data are presenting. And some of these, I think, importance of these links between what's happening in the rural area and the, uh, the urban situation. Let me go back to Ibrahima. Um, can you talk a little bit um, about what is, um, how you're uh, using these results uh, for, policy discussion in Senegal, Ibrahim. Yeah, thank you, Malcolm. Uh, Printex data is used in the dashboard, which is a land governance monitoring initiative developed by International Land Coalition based in Rome. Uh, the dashboard is now in a test phase in three countries within the world, uh, Nepal, Colombia, and Senegal. IPAR has the honor to carry out the process, and I'm the coordinator. So the dashboard evaluates the national framework through 33 indicators organized around 10, around the 10 international land coalition commitment for people-centered land governance. For its commitment, three indicators are proposed. One indicator on the legal framework, one indicator on the implementation of that framework, and one indicator on the perception. So, uh, Printex is needed uh, wherever dashboard will be implemented this year or next year. So I think it, it will be a great opportunity for collaboration between Global Land Alliance and International Land, Land Coalition to have to work to, uh, closely together to make it to make it happen. IPAR, uh, as I said, as a think tank based in West Africa, can provide help where needed. So the main question now we have is Printex, uh, dashboard, so what? Yeah, the main question is that, so what? Why we are using those tools? So now we are engaging our platform to discuss this issue of appropriation or utilization of the data available, um, data available uh, given by the, these tools, so dashboard and Printex. So how we can influence the decision makers based on the results that we have within Printex and Dashboard. Evidence policy making, something like that. So the Senate, in Senegal, we are trying to make the link with other with our existing platform. We are conduct, conducting now the national engagement strategy process with the support of ILC. I'm also the, co the facilitator of the, this process. So we have um, also a multi-stakeholders platform around the VGT's uh, voluntary guidelines on governance of tenure and land governance, something like that, which uh, all the stakeholders are involved with the support of FAO. So this platform is led by the government within the Ministry of Agriculture and uh, the National uh, Peace Organization, CENSER, is there, and IPAR hosts the secretariat of this platform. Then we are using all the platforms that we have to discuss about the issue about the issue of dashboard and print or so what. We are convening a lot of meetings, and all the representatives coming from the government, the civil, sec civil society, and the private sector, uh, all the attendees, they know now about the, the existing of the tools, and we are trying to build advocacy based on the results that we have. Like now, we want to base the production of the policy on Result on uh, evidence, yeah, evidence that, that that we are collecting on the field. So what we want to achieve at the at the end of the day is, as I said, to have pol land policies that take into account the data collected by the tools such as Prindex and and uh, dashboard. But it's uh, now early to talk about the results that we have within this. But it is ongoing process, and we carry, and we think that uh, before we finish the process, we will be able to uh, achieve our 
our objective. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Ibrahim. And uh, maybe we can come back in questions to some more of the specifics uh, around those uh, that agenda. Um, Claudia, I'd also like to hear from you um, about how you um, may uh, be using uh, Prindex data um, in your uh, work in research and policy analysis in Honduras. Gracias, Malcolm. Los datos Prindex en Honduras realmente es que favorecen el conocimiento de las percepciones de población, lo que permite tener datos concretos para el desarrollo de investigaciones tanto académicas, procesos de incidencia local, incluso procesos de planificación y gestión territorial. Yes, so the Prindex um, data, data are um, permitting a, a growth of knowledge about perceptions from the population and this is uh, providing new specific data for academic research, for processes of local advocacy, and even for territorial planning and management processes. Actividades como el bono tecnológico, la asistencia técnica, los seguros agrícolas, o el fortalecimiento de sistemas de riego y drenaje, aunque son políticas públicas nacionales, pues no han llegado a los grupos campesinos como para fomentar o aumentar su productividad. Y por su parte, el impulso de la agricultura familiar debería de estar orientado a familias sin tierras, pero deberían crearse acciones dirigidas al sector reformado, por lo que consideramos que los datos Prindex pueden ser una plataforma ideal para conocer estos sectores desprotegidos. Yes, so um, activities such as um, uh, technological bonds, uh, technical assistance, agricultural insurance, um, improvement of irrigation and drainage systems um, are all, um, uh, even though these are indicated as national public policies, they have not um, reached uh, the campesino peasant groups um, to increase their productivity. Um, this uh, support for family farming should be aimed actually at families without land, um, but actions um, aimed at the uh, agricultural reform sector um, should also be created. So Prindex data can be an ideal platform for understanding um, more about these unprotected sectors. Mm -hmm. El trabajo de titulación realizado por el INA, que es el Instituto Nacional Agrario, se realiza en coordinación con los líderes indígenas y afrodescendientes y organizaciones que les apoyan o representan, como es la Organización del Derecho Étnico Comunitario y la Organización Fraterna Negra Hondureña para los Garífunas, o la Unidad de la Mosquitia para los Misquitos, entre otras, por lo que Prindex podría proporcionar información realmente valiosa y complementaria vinculada a datos de grupos indígenas y grupos afrodescendientes que son mayormente los más desprotegidos. So the, the titling work carried out by the National Agrarian Institute um, is carried out in coordination with indigenous and Afro-descendant leaders and the organizations that support and represent them, such as the Organization for Ethnic Community Development and the uh, Honduran Black Fraternal Organization for the Garifanas and the uh, Mosquitia, uh, master organization for the mosquitoes, uh, among others. So Prindex could uh, provide complementary information uh, linked to data from these indigenous and Afro-descendant groups. Um, thank you, Claudia. And maybe we can come back to more of these specifics in questions. Let me just finish this round, um, conscious of time for a broader set of questions. But Alfred, um, can you also briefly talk um, a little bit about how you see these de uh, data being relevant for the issues you've described in Liberia. Oh, absolutely, Malcolm, and thank you so much for coming back again to me. And I think uh, just following up on the comments uh, made by Ibrahim and also on Claudia in terms of, uh, of how they see that uh, this data could be used with uh, local stakeholders um, and on the ground, I think this is certainly uh, where we are, are seeing that. And uh, I mentioned earlier on about, um, you know, Liberia passing one of the most groundbreaking progressive land right legislation. 
um, say uh, this is probably um, maybe first of its kind. We might be seeing global in terms of uh, how this has really elevated uh, customary land right to the same status of private property rights and actually uh, recognizing the rights of communist indigenous people, or whether they have deed or no deed. Uh, and so we see exactly how you know this uh, the, the pin rest process and the data itself can be used as a major driver to ensure the implementation of this law. Because like I said earlier on, a law is as good as its implementation. But you see, Malcolm, um, pin rest is just one of several of the global initiatives that is addressing the real issue of land tenure redundant tools. Um, we have the landmark initiative, um, we have the dashboard, which Ibrahima referred to by the ILC. Um, we have the right and resources tenure data. Um, we have um, behind the brand campaign, which has been launched by Oxfam. Um, and then uh, we have the right and resources tenure data too. We have um, the SDGs and the VGGTs. Now, the problem with all of these things, including PINREST, we have talked about, is that a lot of this data, a lot of the analysis that come out can only be found on the internet. And we are talking about how we want to ensure the building of a global movement to drive reform around land. To ensure that that happens, we have to find a way to empower local stakeholders, activists, land rights defenders, local communities, indigenous people, um, and development partners who are on the ground, who are in the field, making sure that they have this data in their hands in the process that allows for co-creation and co-design of these tools. As it is now, for example, many of these activists, many of these local stakeholders who are on the ground, who find it very difficult even trying to just access what the data is all about and how it can be able to draft it from. I think PINRES and many of the other data initiatives and tools that have been designed are only going to be meaningful and achieve their results it's a process of co-creation and co-designing these tools to local communities has an empowerment process is placed within their hand. And this is where, for example, a lot of my recent work, since I've come to the U.S., I've not easily been involved, but I've been involved in this whole idea of trying to develop a global land tenure security index. But this index um, is going to be involved in the co-creation and the co-design of a global land tenure security index. And with two major goals, one would be a person of trying to measure, rank, and score how governments protect the land rights of their citizens, especially the vulnerable ones. And the second would be to co-create and communicate to put in land, to put land data and tools in the digestible format in the hands of local stakeholders to drive policy reform and implementation. Since most of the land tenure data tools are mainly held, like I said, by international organizations, we can also plan on designing these and making sure that PINRES and other publicly available data are in a user-friendly format and language so that the local stakeholders themselves are the major drivers of these policy reforms here and there. Mm. And the way we're seeing that is that uh, we want to make sure that it's only when local communities and stakeholders are in power with their own data, because this is what the data is. The print rest analysis talk about the respondents, and most of them were local stakeholders. It is that data that's been analyzed. It's only when this data translated into digestible format are put back into the hands of these local actors who already see in terms of how this reform would be like. And so we've been thinking about a number of initiatives with pin rest, for example, we hope we can be a part of this in West Africa. Starting with, for example, trying to maybe identify who the local stakeholders would be, trying to develop um, um, the messaging and composing or, or tools that will allow for that, making sure that we can follow up these kind of processes and pilot testing them and then documenting lessons learned. So I really believe that it's only through this process of co-creation, which I think to be the next wave of investment that will now allow local actors to use their own data and tools to be able to drive this reform. If we don't do that, it means that we're going to have a lot of these data still being deposited on the internet and not having real relevance at the grassroots level in the field. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Alfred. And I really um, picking up that phrase, co-creation of uh, data and making data useful um, by stakeholders. Let me um, now um, go to um, uh, David Amia. Unfortunately, um, Joanne Kagwanja from Africa Land Policy Center uh, had the last minute travel obligation and is not able to join us. So um, I'm asking David Amia 
uh, who is working with um, Prindex and the Africa Land Policy Center uh, to give some uh, insight into that uh, into into that um, side of things. Uh, David, the microphone is yours. Thank you very much, Malcolm. Uh, and we thank Alfred, Ibrahima, and Claudia by giving us the country perspective on uh, what Prindex is for and can be used for. Uh, on the regional level and continental level, you know, Prindex is engaging also with uh, regional bodies and international bodies, such as the UN Habitats and uh, the Green Project, and also the African Land Policy Center, you know, ALPC. Prindex recognized the importance that these uh, centers, regional and international centers, pray in ensuring that all land users have equitable access to land and security of all land rights by facilitating effective partnership, dialogue, and capacity building for participatory and consultative land policy formulation and implementation, as well as efficient and transparent land distribution in both customary and statutory jurisdictions. ALPC mission in Africa is to assess, assist member states in the implementation of the declaration on land issues and challenges in Africa in accordance with the framework and guidelines on land policy in Africa and in, in order to achieve socioeconomic development, peace and security, environmental sustainability, and thus contribute to the achievement of the Agenda 2063 and the SDG. ALPC as an African institution is focused on assisting African Union member states and the regional economic, commi economic commissions in the implementation of the Declaration on Land Issues and Challenges in Africa in accordance with the framework and guidelines on land policy in Africa. In order to achieve the socioeconomic development, peace, security, and environmental sustainability. Therefore, Prindex and ALPC are collaborating in three major areas. First, in monitoring and evaluating of the progress in the implementation of the AU Declaration on Land Issues and Challenges in Africa through the monitoring and evaluation of land governance in Africa, the MELA program, which support reporting to the AU Specialized Technical Committee on Water, Agriculture, and Environment to inform the AU Summit of the status of land governance in Africa. Two, in outreach and advocacy on the role of data in driving national policy reforms that expand secure rights for all to help achieve the SDG and the Agenda 2063 with particular emphasis on the Miller and Prindex and other credible initiatives. Three, building capacity of ALPC and network of excellency on land governance in Africa, the Naga members, to collect, use, and disseminate data on perceived tenor security. Prindex aim to support ALPC and uh, we are working on the MOU and other initiatives so that we will be able and rapidly and cost effectively collect data on perceived tenor security in all African countries. So far, we have 10 out of the 15 uh, data that were collected, you know, 10 countries in the 15 countries that data have been collected. And we are hoping to roll out to many African countries in the second half of this year and also to 2019. Two, process and analyze the data to provide evidence on perceived tenor security and report against key indicators in the declaration. And three, making data publicly available to help build a data repository at continental level and enable a wide range of stakeholders to use the data on perceived technical security. So, uh, Alfred, as you said, that is what we are working on to work with, to make the data publicly available. And four, 
using regional and global perception data as evidence to drive national policy reforms that expand secure rights for all to help achieve the 2030 SDG agenda and the African Union Declaration. Five, to engage with country level intermediaries and national government to influence policy to provide strong evidence to drive the SDG process and implement the AU declaration. And six, work with the African regional commissions and the UNICA entity to support land policy reforms and also work with research community through NAGA to support research on key land issues. And lastly, but not the least, working with NAGA institutions to build capacity to develop and undertake an analyzed tailored surveys at country level using the printers as an indicator. It is expected that a close and effective co a cooperation between printers and other continental and regional bodies such as ALPC will support the commitment made by African head of state to poverty eradication with the view to raising the standard of living of people and the well-being of future generation and the centrality of land to sustainable economic, socioeconomic development and growth and also the security of social, economic and cultural livelihood of the people in Africa. Thank you, David. And we're really looking forward to um, to working with uh, ALPC and the MELA countries and pretend Prindex, uh, I think, can be one of the key um, uh, perception data in the MELA monitoring framework. Um, the questions are pouring in from the um, from the participants. I really appreciate everybody who is uh, raising questions in the webinar. So before I go back to um, the panelists for some additional remarks, let me try to um, to um, address a few questions. There's one uh, from Brazil, if we will be in doing Brazil in the next round, and the answer is um, yes in the 2019. Um, we also have some pilot uh, a pilot survey on Brazil um, that we did, which I believe data is available on the land portal. Um, question about um, how can we follow up? Uh, we would love to follow up with all of you. Prindex.net has contact information, um, as does the Global Land Alliance website. Um, we would be very interested to hear um, directly from people. Um, some question from India. We did a very large pilot uh, test in India that's representative at the state level. Um, and I would be interested to, um, to take offline discussions about uh, Karnataka state and uh, implications for the construction center in, sector. In general, we think that providing these data uh, is certainly very interesting to the real estate professionals and construction professionals that I've heard, which, which see it as a, an indicator of the potential security for investment. Um, there's a question uh, from Mike about um, uh, questions on uh, other, asking about other people who have lost, uh, if the, the respondent is aware or has seen land laws. We do ask about that, and we see that perception of insecurity is much higher, I think, as we would expect in the, uh, for people who have experienced or have had a, a known someone who experienced a loss of land or other property. Um, also another question uh, from John about um, the, are, are we disaggregating? Are we asking about uh, community ownership? The answer is yes. Um, we do ask about um, uh, what kind of tenure regime um, so we we can do some analysis and we also ask about if they're aware of others in the community um, losing their rights. So I just wanted to take um, a few of those. Um, the uh, question about the availability of the data sets, the country, uh, these 15 that we have 
currently collected are available for download. This is an open data um, uh, license. Um, so you can go on the printx.net uh, website and access the data files and the questionnaire. Um, and those are available for use. We'd be very interested in um, the kind of analysis or uh, that people do with these. Um, let me go back then uh, for a moment uh, to our panelists. Um, I was, um, I think in each case, um, you know, people, each of the panelists described uh, policy processes in which they're involved. And if I could just ask the question to each of them, you know, what is really the, um, the top priority um, right now that you're focused on in these uh, policy discussions? Maybe I could do the same order, Ibrahima. Uh, <coughs> uh, yes. And about the, uh, the multi-stakeholder platform and the discussions uh, that you're having there, what are, what are some of the top uh, priority um, issues which you are uh, you're addressing? Okay, I think I may have uh, lost Ibrahima temporarily. Claudia, can we take the same? Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, I'm here's here. Ibrahima. Yes, yeah, please go ahead. Okay, uh, I say uh, our top priority now is to finalize the analysis of the, the data that we have in Senegal in order to produce a, uh, artic a scientific article and uh, based on the results. The other, uh, the other step will be to, uh, to build the advocacy based on the result in order to cut target the, uh, the policy makers. I think now we are in the, um, uh, how to say, election. Uh, the election is uh, are, are coming soon. The president presidential election, they are coming soon. So we wait after the election in order to involve all the decision makers to share with them the result, even the parliamentaries. And I think also we want, as we are intervening in the sub-region, we want also to reach the other region to take the results to take the, base, the database, analyze the results, the data we have there, and see how to have the same exercise in those countries to involve the government, to involve the stakeholders, and then to try to, uh, yeah, to influence the policies based on the results that we have within Prindex and Dashboard. So in our perspective, Prindex and Dashboard are linked uh, are, are linked and then uh, we will run them in all the countries that we are, uh, we are where we are intervening. Okay, thank you, Ibrahim. So, kind of direct uh, dialogue with uh, government officials and parliamentarians. Um, mm -hmm. Claudia, could I go to you with um, what your view on some of the immediate priorities now in Honduras? Bueno, realmente es que en Honduras. Eh tenemos eh, prioridades muy marcadas, aunque el marco legal del país está armonizado de la Constitución de la República, la ley de la reforma agraria, ley de la propiedad, no se, ha logrado, no se ha logrado generar una mejor distribución y tenencia de la tierra. Uh -huh. So we have some, uh, some very key priorities that even though the, um, the laws are um, aligned with the Constitution, that is to say the grain reform law and the property law, um, these are not um, necessarily translating into um, um, real land access for the population. Por lo que existe una necesidad prioritaria de un nuevo proceso de reforma agraria que rompa con los latifundios centrados en los monocultivos, sobre todo como comenté en La Palma, y en esa misma línea es fundamental identificar la manera en que el extractivismo interactúa con, con un proceso de despojo territorial so uh, what's uh, key priority is the um, need to break the um, scheme of um, monoculture uh, in the um, and 
uh, large scale investment, particularly the palm uh, sector and um, um, a, a different scheme that actually is a, a territorial development. Y en ese sentido, pues como universidad, con estos datos Prindex, realmente tratamos, o trata, y tratamos y trataremos de empoderar a todos estos grupos vulnerables de datos confiables, de información que esté objetivamente y académicamente respaldada para que sus luchas eh, sean fundamentadas y no sean unas luchas que queden nada más en el discurso. Right, so we want to use uh, this kind of data that are uh, reliable, um, and um, uh, we have confidence in to empower um, local groups uh, to be able to engage in these um, um, in, engage in these struggles. Thank you, uh, Claudia. Okay. Um, Alfred, um, I wanted to come back to you. Um, conscious of the the new land rights act in Liberia, and how do you see the sort of uh, Key, um, key priority right now? Well, um, I think in terms of Liberia, um, the real topmost priority is uh, working on uh, trying to uh, implement uh, the current uh, land right act. And I think the first step in that regard is the whole idea of uh, uh, community self identification. Uh, because these are like, are like, I see two major flashpoints. Um, around you know the perception of the issue of rights is uh, where communities are being dispossessed by uh, massive land grabbing to the whole idea of uh, community self identification on community customary land areas, but also in community customary areas already awarded um, to concessions and how communities can be able to go and self identify their customary land area and demarcate those areas and then get full recognition by the government of Liberia. Now, I think I need to point out a very important caveat here because I think part of the problems that we see more and more is that it's easier in terms of the struggle that we raised in the last 10 years to try to wrestle and devolve power onto communities. But the real problem comes with trying to design how you can implement that. And as we've seen, for example, what has happened with community forestry in Liberia, you know, where, for example, it is more so it, it is a process that is, you know, driven by private interests and development partners and not really driven from the bottom up, is that the self identification process, if it is not co created and co designed by those whose land have been threatened, where the data and the tools and the empowerment processes are not placed within their hands in the format and the language known to them. That will suddenly evolve a model that in itself we have to disenfranchise those communities. We've seen an example how that has happened with the community forestry law in Liberia. We've seen an example how that happened with community forestry in many parts of Africa. And I think really trying to co-design and co-create a self-identification process that is driven by the communities, that is based on that local governance, land tenure system would be to me the major priorities allowing this to go forward. I will really ensure that the laws that we have will really deliver on poverty, on sustainable development, on the environment, and on tenure. So I think trying to allow that to go forward will be very important as a first step. The other stuff I see, for example, is the whole idea of making sure that not just PINRES, like I said earlier on, but all these other initiatives, I think there should be an effort now to go and see how we can move some of these tools, some of these very good initiatives that are internet-based, that are online-based, that are in the archive, that are in the different database available online. How we can now start develop them in digestible format and making sure that those tools and the data are actually available to those who are in the front line. Because if they have those tools available in the front line, they can better drive and decide the kind of reform they want to see happening. So for us, these are like the two major kind of priorities we want to see. Implementing the, the act, making sure that the self-identification process is co-created and co-designed with those whose land have been threatened, and then making sure that all of these other tools have been developed by these different initiatives, the BINRES, the Landmark, the Dashboard, and all of that also available to all of the stakeholders globally around the world. Right. Okay, thank you very much, Alfred. And I certainly hear from each uh, of the panelists the real um, need to go from 
to actually put the teeth uh, into the implementation of laws that deliver uh, for citizens on the ground, whether it's uh, agrarian reform legislation in Honduras, land legislation in Senegal, or the uh, self-identification process in, um, in Liberia. And I think this idea of having uh, continual monitoring and making uh, data on these things available, holding um, all stakeholders uh, accountable through data is, and this idea of democratization of, of data is something that we're, we're all very interested in. Um, I'm very glad to uh, see that uh, 64 attendees um, are going the whole distance with us. I have several more questions um, coming in from participants. Let me um, try to take a couple of those before we wrap up. Um, I want to repeat that the um, data set is available um, on the printx.net website along with the questionnaire and code book um, in standard uh, statistical software. You're welcome to download that and it can be uh, used on a Creative Commons basis. Uh, we just are asking for attribution and um, and uh, to not uh, change anything in the in the data set obviously um, in the use um, I have a question about um, uh, ideas for conducting qualitative research on this question of um, of perceptions um, I certainly think that the the work we've done on and in the pilots in which particularly the 2017 uh, three country um, test has a, a, a number of insights about the different ways that uh, we try to uh, measure these perceptions. I think there's also some, uh, some very interesting growing uh, academic work on perception from um, off the top of my head, um, Van Gelder, um, also from Ben Linkow, and I think those, I'd also be glad to, to follow that up offline. Um, it's a question about uh, informing work on intergenerational transmission of land. We're not um, addressing that in too much detail. The one area that we ask about, as we saw in the presentation, was about women's um, feelings, perceptions of security in the event of uh, death um, uh, of a spouse. And, and we also have um, you know, some question of, about um, inheritance. So, um, but I wouldn't say we have a deep understanding of intergenerational uh, issues. I am seeing, um, Other question, I'm just reading through. Okay, I think then um, I'm just going to leave it at that. We definitely invite you um, all to um, to visit uh, the Prindex.net website. We would like to um, also invite um, you to sign up for our mailing list. This is the first 15 countries. There are 18. Uh, more countries um, where data is being collected. In fact, it's wrapping up as we speak, and we are uh, working, finalizing arrangements to go into the field uh, with Gallup on the World Poll in 107 more countries in 2019. Um, I would like to finalize by giving a, a, a huge thanks to uh, our panelists today, Ibrahim Aka from Ipar in Senegal, Alfred Brownell, uh, from Green Advocates at Northeastern University Law School, Claudia Mondragon from the Territorial Observatory at the National University of Honduras. And I'd like to give a major um, thanks to um, our, our supporters at UK Aid and Omidyar Network, and particularly to the LAND portal, which has made this whole uh, webinar possible. And I would like um, to uh, definitely invite everybody to to visit the LAND portal. It literally is a portal um, into an amazing richness of country data. There uh, is um, Prindex um, 
site there also, which also covers our pilots. Thank you very much to everyone, and we will uh, close with that.